As uh, many of you know, uh, our project consists of an analysis of the systemic issues within the supply chain in the garment industry. And on, although we knew about the environmental uh, issues that uh, were uh, happening uh, during the production processes of clothing, we finally decided to focus on the social problems atta attached to the supply chain in this uh, globalized industry. But uh, first, um, I would like to, to uh, talk about our motivation to start this project. Uh, obviously, we were all very interested in, in the topic, but uh, there were slight differences in uh, our personal um, motivation when we approached uh, th this issue. Um, Amy uh, uh, was especially interested in uh, studying uh, whether the CSR uh, uh, practices of the companies uh, involved in the garment industry were uh, actually uh, uh, tackling the, the social issues uh, that emerge from the, their activities uh, as part of their core business. Um, um, as far as uh, uh, Carlos is concerned, he was uh, most interested in, in uh, finding out uh, whether uh, the, this, uh, this industry, this, uh, these uh, uh, companies were actually bringing sustainable development to um, the, to the uh, countries where the supply chain was, the, the was uh, actually settled. Um, as for me, as I didn't know much about the issue, but after uh, our class with our professor uh, Son Anset, I was, uh, it really caught my attention of uh, the, the magnitude of the problem, both in terms of the number of people affected and the inherent uh, difficulties of the, of the situation. So uh, we conducted our uh, research uh, through um, uh, literature reviews and six interviews. Um, first, uh, we, uh, we looked at the pressures and, and drivers that uh, every stakeholder involved in, the in, in, the in, the, in this industry had, um, and also what they were doing to, uh, uh, regarding those issues. And then we, um, we identified what we consider were the, were the best practices in the sector, and we also uh, analyzed uh, some case studies. Um, finally, we proposed the uh, strategies for the future. And as you can see in the agenda, we are in this presentation, we're going to cover the drivers and the strategies. And uh, while we are, we're doing our research, um, unfortunately, the, this, the, this, uh, Rana, the Rana Plaza accident happened on, on April 24th, which uh, highlighted even more the, the seriousness of the, of the problem. And now um, Amy is going to explain uh, the drivers. <laughs> Thank you, Justino. So as Justino mentioned in this project, we looked at um, some of the incentive structures and pressures that are put on these four main stakeholder groups um, in this industry, which were the companies, uh, the factories where these garments are supplied, the governments where the factories are located, and factory employees. So the first group we looked at were the multinational companies. These companies are going to include brands like Levi's, Gap, H&M, um, Zara, which is owned by Inditex, all of these brands that we know and love. Um, the first uh, group that really influences their actions are the consumers. And although consumers have the possibility to really influence uh, these companies in terms of being more proactive in terms of social responsibility, uh, our research showed that Many times in questionnaires, they'll say that they're willing to spend more on ethically sourced clothing. However, uh, market research by companies shows that their purchasing practices don't reflect those statements. And that what they're lo really looking for in terms of um, clothing are new styles at really low prices. The next group we have are uh, the investors, which also really influence the decisions made by uh, multinationals. And what they're looking for is a return on their investment. They're looking for growth profit um, and really getting their money back and, and making a, a return on that investment. Um, we did an interview with an investment advisor and he told us that they have all these different tools um, and indicators to explain the performance um, of a company, whether or not to invest, and none of those tools uh, include social responsibility indicators, um, which shows that for them it really isn't a big issue in terms of looking at the success of a company. So with these, this, if, these two pressures and some other ones, we came to the conclusion that what really drives these companies are the idea to maximize profit and to maintain economic growth. 
Um, and as you can see, this list is not including social responsibility because their main um, pressure groups are not asking or showing that that is an important issue for them. Um, so with these drivers, what companies really need to make sure happens in their supply chain is that it is constant, efficient, and timely. There is one group that does try to pressure multinationals to improve their social responsibility, which are NGOs, activist groups, um, nonprofits. However, um, most academics agree that an, the only time they've really been efficient at getting these companies to change is um, when they've really affected the marketplace and they've got consumers or investors or some other group behind it. Um, but, but alone, they really haven't been that efficient um, in getting some change in, in multinationals' behavior. The next group we looked at were the suppliers. So these are the factories that are producing the products. And as you would expect, the biggest uh, group that puts pressure on them are the multinationals. However, the pressure comes in two separate dialogues. The first dialogue comes from the procurement department. And the procurement department is the department that actually places the orders in the factories. And what they're looking for is the highest quality product at the lowest price in the quickest amount of time. The other dialogue, the other pressure comes from the corporate res responsibility department, which of course is looking to improve health and safety and to improve labor conditions, which is going to include increasing wages and decreasing hours worked. So as you can see, these two groups are sending different messages, one asking for lower costs and one asking to raise wages, um, and it really isn't showing the suppliers a consistent message from the companies. And in fact, a lot of times the procurement department keeps um, short-term contracts with these suppliers and keeps and ha they have really low margins which really doesn't give them an incentive to actually embrace what the corporate responsibility department is asking for so it's really a, a big problem for suppliers to try to deal with these two mixed messages the next group we looked at were the governments and again these are governments in the countries where the um, the factories are located um, and we, we were asking ourselves why are they not playing a bigger role and trying to improve labor conditions within their country. And our research showed us that it kind of all started um, more or less when globalization began to take hold. And as that happened, um, and these companies started to move their supply chains all across the world, um, they did it at such a fast pace that a lot of times these governments had a hard time keeping up in terms of implementing legislation and enforcement. So this, this created what many people call a governance gap in which implementation of, of, le of legislation or actually creating legislation was either weak or non-existent, which left the employees um, and the environment oftentimes unprotected from um, the multinationals and the suppliers. So as these groups are looking for economic um, benefit and profit, uh, oftentimes that comes at the expense of employees in the environment. These companies, uh, the multinationals, did try to fill this gap slightly with codes of conduct and auditing systems. However, um, our research showed that most people agree that these have been rather ineffective in, in covering this, these labor conditions and this, uh, this gap. In areas where the governments have tried to create um, legislation, they've, had a, they've hit a couple roadblocks. Some of the ones that, we're gonna, that uh, are included are corruption in their country or conflicts of interest um, within politics. Um, so sometimes their factory owners may be part, or maybe also a politician, which creates a conflict of interest. The other one is lobby groups and factory owners themselves trying to keep regulation weak. Um, so those are some issues that they've had to try to really get the implementation of, of legislation on this issue. And the last group we looked at were the employees. And as you probably have seen, employees haven't been mentioned yet as an influencer of any of the other three actors. And this is because they're at the bottom of the supply chain. And they have very little influence over ma really making a change within this industry. And this is mostly due to the fact that because of this complex web of incentives and pressures from the other three actors, a lot of times that pressure gets pushed down onto them and comes into, uh, it turns into the conditions that we see, long hours, low wages, poor conditions um, that gets put on the, the employees. And we asked ourselves why, what was the incentive of these employees to work in the sector if they had such poor conditions and low wages. And we found that in most of these countries, uh, due to the lack of skill of these, of these workers, 
this is actually the best alternative um, in terms of work for them, in terms of income stability, um, and a lot of times physical con their physical ability to do the work and conditions in the factories. Okay, good morning. I want to introduce our strategies, this, the way how we believe that we can introduce improvements inside the sector. The strategy number one is our practical approach. We believe that we can start doing actions regarding with strategy number one that I'm going to introduce later on. The strategy, the strategy number two is mm, the innovative approach that we also believe that is not possible to do it right now, but we think that is going to be or can be implemented in the next years. And the strategy number three, it's the system change. It's how we think we can change the current condition of the sector in order to improve the conditions. Mm, to start talking a little bit about the strategy number one, it's important to say that this mm, strategy uh, was established for us uh, in according how are the current conditions of the industry. And we think that the fact that the four, the four uh, main players of the sector has to be present in strategy number one, uh, for the case of employees and suppliers, they don't have so much influence over the sector. So we have developed 17 proposals that will be addressed for multinationals, for developing countries, and for developed countries in order to improve the condition, as I said before, in the sector. Mm, it's important to say that each proposal is addressed to a key issue that we saw in our research. And for a matter of time, I'm not going to explain the 17 proposals. I'm going to explain a few from each player that we have. And for the case of multinationals, I want to start saying that the reducing the size of the supply chain is a fact that will allow the multinationals to monitor how the operations are in the supply chain and also will um, give benefits for them because they, have, they will have the, the ability to improve the problems or the issues that they will see in the operations. The second idea that I want to explain is the long-term contracts. This is important because right now the industry, it's, um, it seems that is conducted by a short-term vision. It's something that in our research and according with our, some of our interviews that we perform, this is something that appears in every, every time that we were discussing with these interviewers and also in the literature. The fact that we can mm, implement these contracts is going to benefit the, the industry because we can promote the, a better channel of communication between the factory and the multinational as well to foster a stronger relationship between them. And the collaboration throughout multi-stakeholder engagement is something that for us is really important too because we just see that the multinational also can mm, implement these ideas in order to probably share the research, the implementation techniques as well to co-create solutions in order to give improvements over the sector. For the case of the developing countries, the first that I want to talk is the labor condition as many of you know. Uh, the problems with the labor conditions are more related with salaries and also with the conditions inside the factory. But the fact that they, um, for the case of Bangladesh, uh, most of the workers that, do, that works in the sector doesn't reach the level of living wage or decent wage to have a proper access for the basic, for the basic needs. The health and safety is also really important because as we saw in one of our first slide, the accident that happens in April 24 in Bangladesh, it was like a demonstration that this is an issue that we have to care about. And it's important to say the, the Bangladesh accident is not something that appears. It has been accidents in the past, but this puts this topic again in the mainstream. And the investment policy is also important too because um, some companies are moving not to the fact that they want to produce cheap. They also want to um, produce in a safe environment with safe conditions and in proper um, environment, to say in this way. And last, uh, for the case of developed countries, the speculation. We just want to enforce 
the laws re related with speculation because we want to avoid to include practice of speculation inside the sector. Then it's important to say if one of more of these proposals are implemented, we are going to achieve a positive impact. But if we want to achieve uh, the largest impact possible, we strongly recommend that all of them are applied. Okay, now <clears throat> um, I'm going to explain uh, what this uh, second strategy is about. Um, as uh, Carlos mentioned, this is a more like a, a, an innovative uh, uh, approach or, or a strategy. Um, uh, basically, this uh, strategy seeks to uh, um, create a more uh, a transformative change uh, um, in, the, in the industry uh, by creating a, an international uh, environment where uh, all these issues that we've been talking about uh, are discussed and negotiated and agreed upon the solutions. Um, so, um, basically, up, up, till, up, uh, up to now, um, the, the different stakeholders in the, in the industry have been working uh, uh, in silos um, within different uh, collaborative partnerships or models um, and also and usually working on uh, specific issues within the sector. Um, uh, the idea uh, is that instead of incremental fragmented uh, changes, uh, we can um, um, promote uh, a, a partnership uh, where all, of, all the stakeholders are involved in, the, in finding the, the solutions for, for the systemic issues that, that we have. Um, uh, the, the, the framework uh, right now is uh, that there's an international uh, trade framework, so, but we believe that this, uh, this framework uh, should uh, change and should include some, some, sh some changes that, that improve these social, social aspects. Um, so the, the idea uh, would be to uh, uh, create an NGO, an NGO coalition, uh, which uh, main role would be to uh, to start to uh, promote a, a multi-stakeholder uh, multi -stakeholder partnership and, and to uh, initiate the, the engagement process. Um, this uh, uh, NGO coalition will start, will, start uh, will have to begin with uh, what we call uh, the positive uh, responsible lobbying which is basically a shift from the uh, pressure, the, the actual model of NGOs pressuring uh, multinational companies to uh, promoting uh, col collaboration and, and dialogue. And um, the, uh, this NGO uh, coalition, like I said, will promote this multi-stakeholder uh, partnership, will be, be composed by the, the NGO coalition and er, er, every uh, stakeholder involved in the, in the industry, suppliers, uh, multinational companies, governments, and, and employees, uh, representatives or, or, or trade unions. Um, to this uh, multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder partnership, uh, they would, uh, this, uh, they would uh, come up with uh, a plan, what we call a plan. This plan would consist of uh, a series of goals that they would have to be uh, achievable, uh, measurable, uh, time-bound, realistic, and uh, so they would have to uh, cover at least these uh, areas, uh, living wage, minimum labor standards, grievances procedures, freedom of association, collective bargaining, transparency, and traceability. And uh, finally, uh, this uh, plan would be then uh, submitted uh, to the uh, WTO for implementation. This implementation uh, could be either by reforming the actual agreement on, on uh, trade and, and clothing um, within the, the um, uh, WTO, existing already in the in WTO, uh, to a, a different agreement or create a new agreement that includes these uh, social goals. Um, why the WTO? Well, the WTO is the international institution that governs international trade and this is a, a matter of international trade. And also uh, because uh, this would uh, in promote the, that the governments which have not been uh, or have not taken much uh, responsibility for these issues. They, 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 um, this this uh, uh, agreement would foster the role of, of the government. So again, the, the idea is to um, create this uh, uh, transformative change, focusing in basically uh, promoting a more global view of the of the problem, uh, enhancing the role of the of the governments, and finally um, uh, reaching this uh, agreement with uh, the specific goals. And now Amy is going to explain. Okay, so 
On to our last proposal, and again, this proposal is um, focused on really looking at the incentive structures and the pressures that are within the system to try to figure out what types of systemic change can be made in order to really change the business as usual that we see in today in the industry. So this uh, strategy is focused on four different groups, governments, the multinational companies, the consumers, and the investors. And the first group that we looked at was uh, governments. And um, among many different suggestions we gave, some of the ones that we think were important are um, trying to work to really eliminate corruption um, and conflict of issues, uh, conflict of interest problems within these countries, to promote transparency, um, and to really work to foster an, an active civil society, which we will believe we believe um, will promote accountability from the government to their citizens and really help build up the role of these governments to take on the responsibility of protecting labor conditions, um, which as today we've seen is being done mostly by companies and rather um, inefficiently. The next group is the companies, and one of the uh, one of the ideas that we, I, we wanted to highlight was really making sure that these companies include the social costs of production within the cost structures of their products. Um, right now, a lot of these uh, social costs are, have been externalized from the cost structures, um, and we believe that these need to be brought in um, to the cost structures because, as Dove Charney, CEO, CEO of American Apparel, so eloquently says, it costs money to make things. $4.99 doesn't exist unless you're screwing someone. The next group is consumers, and um, we have some several ideas for them as well, but one of the ones that we wanted to highlight today was um, the idea of really using their purchasing power to show companies what they want the future to look like. So if they are uh, buying products from companies that are knowingly disregarding social issues within their supply chain, they're voting for that future, that those acti actions to continue in the future. Um, with their dollars, with their yens, with their euros, whatever, they're voting for that to continue. The next group uh, is investors. And like the consumers, one of the biggest things we believe they need to do is show companies that they're not only interested in the economic performance of these groups, but also in the social responsibility of these companies. Um, and Sean Ansett told us that one of the biggest problems right now is that in many of these companies, they have share traders rather than shareholders, and that uh, the way that these companies are showing that they have success is by short-term goals and short-term profit, short-term sales, which really keeps these companies in um, functioning under the short-term vision of decision-making, and that is directly related to the economic model in which they function today. Yeah, in order to conclude our presentation, um, after all this effort, understanding the problems that has the the, the industry, we have a final reflection that we want to share with you. That is, does the current economic model really promote social development and share value for all groups in the supply chain? Our response to this question is absolutely not. And this is why we propose a mind shift in order to create more value for all the stakeholders in the group. Thank you very much. But you really side, which is what are the key drivers right now? They're very cruel, they sound really horrible, but that's the way companies function, as you started from there. I, I'm very interested in the education of this new awareness. This is what you foster. I've seen all the proposals that you have, and it's really centered around a new mindset and education. Can you say something about this educating the different stakeholders going in a certain direction? Is that okay? That's somebody specifically. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, uh, one of the big areas that we felt that uh, education needs to be through is through, first of all, companies um, really changing their marketing strategies um, and, sh and their way that they're expressing their success to their investors. So in terms of marketing strategies, they can really work to not just say that buying new clothes is great and making sure that fast fashion continues, models like Zara. Um, or H&M, but really trying to show them um, 
the impacts that that has and kind of moving the industry towards, you know, ethically sourced clothing is cool. Um, and in terms of investors, really showing them that, un making them understand that economic performance is not the only thing, and if we just go after that, we're really going to have to leave a lot of the social responsibility issues behind um, and try to figure out a way to kind of make a solution to fix that problem. And also, well, in terms of, of consumers, like any, any big change would require time. There's also the education in, at schools and, and in, in, at home has a lot, a lot to do with it. The only thing is that obviously that kind of change will try, will, you know, we'll, wait, we'll have to wait some time till we see some results. But this is something that actually we, we realize that consumers are going to behave this, the same way they're behaving. And if they're going to change, it's going to be slow. It's a slow change. In, 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 that's for the education part. For the investors also, as Amy was saying, they, would, they should worry more about the social issues, but they should also understand that the long term always required to look not just to the economic side of the, of the business, but also for, for the social and environmental performance. So. And finally, adding like a practical uh, approach, there are like initiatives already that helps or provide <coughs> assistance if you want to change the way how you are cons consuming or in buying things. And a slow fashion is one of them. We include it inside of um, re final report because we believe the, that is promoting a, a, a change in the way how the people is perceiving and also it's l encouraging companies to try to transform their own operations in order to be more like, sustainable in terms of the way how they're doing business. Um, in the summary you sent us, you've got work cited here. Mm -hmm. Did you actually look at any company sustainability reports to find out what they say they're doing? The work cited um, that we sent with the executive summary are just uh, works that were cited within the executive summary. Okay. Um, the full report has the rest. Um, and we did, we did, we actually did a project for um, one of our classes on looking at social indicators and we looked at 10 different companies and 10 different. Um, Nike, Puma, Nike, Puma, Adidas, H&M, Louis Vuitton, Timberland, PBH. Uh, Timberland, Inditex, and probably this, this, this work that we did for the social responsible investment class, um, it starts to like, make us think that probably the current conditions that the multinationals are, or the tools that multinationals were uh, applying to monitor the operations were not um, like achieving the, the, the level of expectations that are probably from the outside. Okay. Because I you just mentioned Sara and Inditex wasn't in the Bangladesh disaster. They have very strong systems in place if you read their sustainability report. So I, I just feel a little bit we're classing everyone as being bad guys and I think the companies are actually doing an awful lot already to solve the problems. Accidents will happen Okay. And Bangladesh was a serious accident, but up to what point can you hold a supplier responsible for that? Um, just in response to that, our project really isn't based on Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. We kind of highlighted yeah. what was going on as we were doing the research, but we started the project before the accident happened, mm -hmm. so um, it was really focused more on the industry in general, and we looked at all the different countries, and then we looked at um, reports by uh, labor unions, reports by NGOs, and tried to figure out the whole picture of what was going on. But there are several disclaimers in our report about how not everybody works the same, not all governments work the same, but um, we tried to just get a basic global picture of what was going on. And some companies are doing more than others. Um, whether or not they, it, it comes across in their reports or other sides agree is debatable. Um, but it is very true. It depends on the company. Because do you, in your report, do you talk about, indus, indus, uh, I think it's called industrial all? You talk about that, do you? Yeah. Is that one of the, yeah, the, the thing is that um, we believe that there are uh, some initiatives going on in the, in the industry. Uh, the problem is that we've, I think we've, we all came to the conclusion that um, the model, the economic model that is working is 
too strong to really, so for, for those initiatives to really have an impact. It is true that in Bangladesh, like, like we were saying in, in our presentation, the conditions in general, it's a very poor country, the, the infrastructure is not good. It probably uh, another thing, another fact that uh, struck me a little bit, well, a lot actually, was that uh, the garment industry is one of the best, if not the best uh, industry in terms also of se on health and safety conditions. So if we can imagine how the other sectors can be, like where, where they, these people uh, can end up working and get with conditions, maybe agriculture, uh, we don't know, maybe they don't have even a job. So it is true that, that you know, the conditions are really bad, but uh, we don't know, we're not sure to which extent that this model, economic model, is going to help to change to shift the situation. That's it. And there are obviously initiatives, but like we, we said, there are initiatives where companies, multinationals, they don't agree, they don't come together. Like they do, they do sometimes, but some, sometimes, like the, the last one about uh, Bangladesh, for some reason, for, for several reasons, the American companies, multinationals, they didn't want to join the, the agreement. So there's always this uh, problem with uh, agreeing the whole sector. I'd like to congratulate you for, I think, taking a very, very broad topic and, and raising some very important issues about it. And I think the challenge is how to extract something practical from such a broad and overwhelming topic. And I think you've made a very, very good effort in, in doing that. So well done for that. Um, I'd particularly like to look at strategy two. You've raised these three strategies, which I think are very uh, well explained and put forward. And on strategy two, I'm most interested in your, your choice of lobbying through an NGO coalition, coalition, the World Trade Organization, which is not exactly known for its transparency and accessibility, many a lobbying group has had difficulties in trying to position things with the <coughs> WTO. So I'd like to know, you've explained why you chose it. Did you look at alternatives? And as well as an NGO coalition, did you also think about other organizations? If you're looking at a multi-stakeholder focus, did you look at other possibilities? And I'm thinking of the media, uh, international fora, uh, uh, business coalitions, that kind of thing. So strategy two, particularly. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, there was a discussion about this actually. Lots and of discussions lots. about this. And uh, well, the, the in the end, I convinced Amy and Carlos. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> kind of Daniel. And Daniel, yeah. Well, Daniel, I don't know if Daniel is convinced <laughs> yet. So, no. The idea. I I well, I personally thought of the WTO because. Uh, it's true, it's, it's, you know, there are many things that need to be improved in the WTO, the way it works, and that's the idea of creating this NGO coalition, which would be an international NGO coalition with all kinds of uh, um, NGOs, but with this approach of having a positive, uh, responsible um, lobbying in, in their attitude. And it can be di different sizes, in, like small sizes, local NGOs, or international NGOs, and they would have to come together to start a multi-stakeholder engagement. In that stakeholder means everyone is invited, and international organizations, in the, uh, business uh, organizations, all of them are invited. The idea is that, my view is that the trade, the World Trade Organization really works well for trade. And it really you know, promotes uh, development the way they, they do it, and, and it works. So if, if we could change a little bit the, the way it works in terms of this social, I think it would be maybe a little bit faster to really save the situation. Obviously, the ILO could be another option. We thought of, of, of any other organizations, but in the end, I think I, I won. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, when he says it works, we, I think part of the thing that, that means is um, that it, there is some sort of monitoring and um, if something, if somebody's not complying with their portion of the deal, there is a process that that can go through, whether or not that works completely well. But in terms of trade, they do have agreements and people are, the trade barriers and all that stuff do work in the sense that um, it is complied with in the most sense. Um, and also we thought that it was a good idea to get the NGO to be positively responsibly lobbying to have everybody to come together and look at this as a systemic issue versus pressuring a company to do something better, which is what's mostly going on now. Um, and so that was kind of the key 
area in terms of the NGO coalition is to try to get them to say, guys, let's get together and let's look at all the issues together and figure out if you do this, this is the consequence it's going to have, and then this other group's going to have to come in and fix that problem. So why don't we look at it all together um, and try to figure out some of the big issues. Um, and also the idea was kind of, it, it comes from the UNFCC where, you know, although things, they haven't gotten that much across yet, there has, it's really opened the dialogue and looked at, helped people look at all the different countries and look at what everybody can do. And a lot of times in the, the COP uh, meetings, the groups come together on the side and really work on issues and have, this, it just kind of opens the dialogue where we feel like that's one of the biggest issues that not that many people are speaking about everything together. And so that was kind of what we were hoping. And the WTO really helps bring the role of the government in. You know, the governments are the ones that are going to have to say, okay, these are the goals that this Molokai stakeholder group has decided. Now we have to negotiate on how it's going to get done, what types of mechanisms we're going to create. So if you guys, if Bangladesh says, okay, I have to do this, but I'm going to need help from another country in terms of finance or capacity building or whatever and create some sort of negotiation on how those goals can be met. So it really helps bolster the role of the, of the government, which we feel like really needs to be done because right now it's just privatization of what governments should be doing in this industry specifically. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>